good afternoon, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Graham, very nice to see you, and thank you for, uh, for coming uh, this afternoon. As you know, we, we issued a consultation document, and indeed we've had a lot of interest in, uh, in the work of the, uh, of the Commission, and we have had a lot of uh, very interesting uh, evidence. Uh, our timetable is tight, but uh, we decided that it was important to hear from a selection of those people who had provided us with, uh, with evidence or who we thought could, uh, could assist in the, uh, in the process, and we're very grateful for your uh, evidence. Um, you're very welcome to, to make some opening remarks if uh, you find that helpful. I, uh, otherwise, I propose that we, you know, we go into, in, into questions. We have one hour for this, uh, for this session. on um, uh, our, our written evidence is very much based on our ex ex 10 years experience of the operation of the act and I've tried to uh, stick to the facts and leave the campaigning to others and I'm very happy to deal with your questions. Um, your evidence makes clear your belief that um, FOI decisions should prevent inappropriate secrecy. Uh, in policy making, but allow a safe space for deliberation. Um, and then in para 20, you say that although the need for safe space ends once a decision is taken, there may still be sensitivity even after that decision is taken. Could you explain the types of case in which this is likely to occur? Yes, um, I, I think we uh, obviously we've been applying the legislation. Uh, under the Freedom of Information Act over the past 10 years, and we've been, uh, all of us, learning, I think. We've uh, uh, published guidance for the application of uh, the exemptions under Section 35 and Section 36. And if we're talking about the, the safe space, uh, which clear, clearly Parliament intended to, should be there, very often the difficult questions where you have to apply the, the public interest test are around the point at which that um, safe space, the opportunity for adv uh, frank advice to be offered and for, for deliberation around important decisions, um, uh, the, the situation changes somewhat uh, when the decision's actually been taken. But it doesn't mean that everything is then immediately publishable because, look, there's still no decision to be taken. Um, it's very difficult to have some hard and fast rule about this. Um, we look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, as one would with all um, public interest test decisions. Um, we would say that, uh, first of all, one would need to look to see whether there are connected decisions which are still to be made. Um, and there still could be a public interest in uh, non-disclosure. Um, it would depend on the circumstances what else was going on. You can't have a hard and fast rule about this. Presumably, that's why Parliament didn't have some uh, blanket absolute exemption. I think what the record shows over the past 10 years is that the run of decisions by the Commissioner and also by the Tribunal uh, is increasingly um, in support of the safe space. If you look at the um, run of decisions around central government where Section 35 might apply, um, I note that in 2015, 83% um, of the time, the, 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 the commissioner protected the safe space and didn't order publication, and the figure for 2014 is 69%. So I'm rather impatient with those uh, who say that freedom of information is a disaster because all these difficult decisions are being compromised because uh, the legislation requires these matters to be published. Legislation doesn't require that. Neither does the commissioner, neither does the tribunal, in very many cases. On the key question of different types of cases which may lead to a, a decision that uh, they'd be opened up immediately after the de decision is made versus others where you've taken a different view, uh, and the central part of the description you just gave us. Would it be fair to say that it might be hard for ministers and civil servants at the time to identify during their deliberation whether or not 
which way your decision would go afterwards about immediate release? Well, I think um, inevitably the, the legislation has put the public service in a position where uh, ultimately um, papers are going to be published and that might be earlier than the 20-year the, the, the rule and I think everybody understands that. But I don't think that there's any evidence that that's providing the provision of frank advice to ministers when the, the exemptions are clear in the, in the legislation. I, I remember one of the witnesses you're talking to uh, later, Lord, Lord O'Donnell, when he was Cabinet Secretary, said, my problem is I never know who I'm, who I'm writing Cabinet minutes for. I think that's putting it rather dramatically. Uh, the public service seems to continue. Uh, advice continues to be offered. Uh, but there is a lot of uh, noise from senior figures saying it's all terrible, the sky is falling. If I was a junior civil servant, I might, I might take a, uh, a cue from the, the rhetoric around the legislation rather than legislation and realize that Sir Humphrey doesn't want me to write this down. But that's not what the, that's not what the law says. In, um uh, you say in part 13 of your evidence, uh, you explain change over time in the number of FOI appeals upheld, uh, and you say this is probably due to the, commission, the commissioner and departments getting a better understanding of the law, and the answers you've just given have been about a dynamic understanding of it. Um, uh, in the light of, of that, and you, you say developing guidance has got clearer, do you think the sections 35 and 36 are clear enough to start with? Yes, I think um, the phenomenon that we saw with the Information Commissioner and the Tribunal ordering far more material to be published in the early years reflected the fact that quite a lot of the material that was being sought was already quite old but hadn't got through the 30-year the, the, the uh, rule as it, as it then was. Um, it's also true that we were all learning on the job um, both sides of the debate, both um, public authorities and the, the Commissioner and the Tribunal. And in 2011, we produced revised guidance on Section 36, and in 2013, revised guidance on, on Section 35. The whole thing has now settled down more. So I think the point I'm making is that there's no case for rewriting the legislation because we've now got to a point where um, the and I, I can't generalize because these decisions will always be taken uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. I know it's a, it's a cliche, but it's, it's true. You're looking at the, the, the balance of arguments in each individual case. I think it would be a great mistake to go for an absolute exemption in areas where qu currently it's qualified by a public interest test. And I think the evidence of the last five years is that everything is settled down um, and we really don't need to panic. Can I just... Um push you on uh, elements of section 35, looking at 1A, that protects information that relates to the development and formulation of government policy. Uh, has, as you've learned over time, has the drafting of this provision caused difficulty in terms of deciding whether information falls within the exemption? I, I don't see that. And at the background to all this, there is the, the, the famous executive override. And if I, if I or my colleagues don't get it, and it's actually the crown jewels, then the, there is a provision for ministers to, to veto a decision of the, the commissioner. You uh, obviously feel confident in the way your guidance um, and decisions develop. Um, do public authorities, do you think, find it difficult to decide if information is related to active policy formulation whether information is policy development or implementation? I've seen no evidence of that, but I could wish that um, my, uh, my operation at the Information Commissioner's Office was resourced to the extent that one could be rather more active in the guidance that one gave public authorities. At the moment, uh, the granting aid has been cut every year I've been Commissioner, and as a result, we simply stick to what we have to do, which is complaint handling. I think we could save everyone a lot of time and, uh, and effort if for a very small investment we were able to be out there giving more, more guidance, uh, more workshops, more, uh, more conferences and so on. And if people are in a muddle, we could very quickly sort it out. But my priority in the six and a half years that I've been commissioner has been to make sure that we, first of all, got rid of the backlog of old FOI decisions and then we didn't allow it to build up again. And so I haven't had any 
uh, resources that I can spend on freedom of information to do that more useful, pro proactive work. And, and is it your experience that public bodies often have to rely on a combination of Section 35 and 36 to protect policy information? Uh, well, they often do, whether they, whether they need to, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I, I think the, the point I'd make to the Commission is the, le the legislation is pretty clear. Uh, we, we, all, we all get it. Uh, I hope we all get it, um, and we can make it work. And we do understand that there is, uh, there is nervousness about really sensitive material being published prematurely. And so there are a number of safeguards written into the legislation, not just the way in which the, these various exemptions, qualified exemptions, are, are um, stated, um, but also the fact that there is the executive override there in, in the background. Last one on safe space. Is there any significant difference between the UK Freedom of Information legislation and the Environmental Information Regulation in terms of protection for safe space? Well, it's expressed in a different way. The Environment Information Regulations do have an explicit presumption that there shall be publication unless otherwise. They don't talk about exemptions, they talk about uh, exceptions, and the key exception uh, which would be equivalent to our own Section 35 and Section 36 in the, in the Act, um, is Regulation 124E, which, which protects uh, internal communications. Um, at the end of the day, uh, when that is engaged, you're still back to the same sort of public interest test calculation. But the difference of opinion I had with the Secretary of State for Transport around the uh, HS2 risk register really turned on whether communications between the Department for Transport and HS2 Limited could be said to be internal communications. Uh, I said not. The Secretary of State disagreed. Um, and uh, that's, that's now um, being sorted out um, at, at judicial review. The important thing to remember about the information the Environment Information Regulations is that it stems from a European Union directive which comes from the Aarhus uh, Convention uh, and, and very importantly the, um, the directive had no provision for an executive override. So many of the difficult cases we've had, HS2, many of um, the, the Prince of Wales's letters um, were really matters uh, that were covered by the, information, the Environment Information Regulations where the regime is a little different. One thing that I would be very concerned about is, is, is if there was much divergence between legislation covering environmental information and the rest of the Freedom of Information Act. And if one made changes to the Freedom of Information Act which were not reflected in the Environment Information Regulations and couldn't be because they, they stem from European legislation would make my job and the job of my colleagues very difficult who are juggling two rather different regimes because very often some of the most uh, contentious matters that come our way are manifestly environmental issues which will be covered by the Environment uh, Information Regulations. On the general point of the public interest test, should it be weighted to take into account, for example, grounds for suspecting wrongdoing or where something has gone wrong in the decision-making process? I think you just have to look at um, the, the, the individual circumstances and list uh, reasons for uh, s uh, safeguarding the decision-making process uh, in future, future decisions and the reasons why there might be some urgent question that needed to be in the public domain. But it's very difficult to generalize. You have to think about individual cases, and it's, it's then a, a, a sum of all the arguments in favor and all the arguments against. Um, uh, and sometimes there's a difference of opinion about whether there is um, an, an inherent public interest in, in, uh, in non-disclosure in the sense of protecting the the safe space. It's a factor one has to take into account, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a sum. Um, uh, you talked about getting clearer and more secure over time in your decisions. Um, why are the uphold record uh, on, uh, of ICO section 3536 decisions by the first tier tribunal uh, so different uh, from the record 
for decisions in general. In other words, the percentage of cases that you uphold um, uh, not so high as... For, I mean, what's the discrepancy between... Well, I think you'd have to ask the, uh, the, the, the tribunal that. I can only speak for the decisions that I and my colleagues take at the ICO. Sometimes the tribunal uh, judges arrive at uh, rather surprising decisions, and, um, uh, and, and that can lead to a bit of a, a problem. Um, uh, uh, the, the famous case of uh, the Prince of Wales' letters, um, I have to remind uh, the campaigners who are very keen to quote this, actually started off, uh, so far as the process is concerned, by um, uh, uh, not upheld decisions by the commissioner. Uh, I ruled that the letters um, did not merit publication. It's not a very heroic thing to say, but that was my view. Uh, the problem that uh, we now seem to be in is that decisions were then taken by the first tier tribunal and the upper chamber and the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court and so on. And the, the difficulty about um, the point at which the veto was applied um, relates to the veto being applied to a judicial decision. Decisions that I take are not judicial. Um, but it's very difficult to veto um, a, a decision of the commissioner with which you agree. <laughs> so I suggest that a challenge for the commission is to come up with the equivalent of the veto, which is an executive override that simply stops the matter being debated further if it is of such crucial importance. It's, it's basically, it's a, it's a simple anagram. You simply turn veto into vote of confidence. You say, I agree with Chris. Uh, if it's absolutely the crown jewels, and then that could put an end to the matter. But in here, I mean, I think the thing that we've noticed is that, you know, looking at the percentage of cases where you make a decision and then subsequently the first tier tribunal and the upper tribunal make a decision, that there seems to be more, um, there might seem to be a large proportion of occasions when there is disagreement between you in relation to 35, 36 than there is overall. Uh, to which the question is, is, is this any reflection of the extent to which the, the operation of 35, 36 is more difficult than other parts of the legislation? I suppose Where your uphold rate seems, you know, I mean, your overall uphold rate is, what, 80% or, or thereabouts mm. um, when yeah. they go to the tribunals. And yet, in the case of, the, of Section 3536, as indeed the evidence from the campaign pointed out, there are quite a lot of cases where the, there were differences of, uh, of, of opinion uh, with the tribunals. I suppose it's always the most uh, difficult cases that will go to the tribunal in the first place. If it was, if it was a no-brainer, then it probably wouldn't proceed further. So that might explain um, differences. I, I've, I've seen... Uh, evidence submitted to you by the um, Campaign for Freedom of Information, which analyzes the tribunal decisions. We didn't seek to do that. We simply looked at our own records over the 10 years. But I, I am aware that there have been um, occasions when the tribunal has taken uh, a, a, a different view, sometimes rather surprisingly. Um, but these are always the most, the most difficult decisions, I suppose. Oh, thank you. Your surprise at the different view um, taken sometimes by the tribunal raises an issue about the layers of appeal and also the role of the first tier tribunal. Do you feel that the first tier tribunal is too close to a decision making process similar to your own and that in reality it is a layer that we could do without? Well, it's. Um it's always a full, a full merits review, I think. Uh, the Scottish system um, is rather different. You can appeal against the decision of the Scottish Information Commissioner uh, uh, by, by, on a point of law going to, going to the courts. Um, and that's quite, that's quite attractive, but I don't kid myself that I might not land up with an awful lot of judicial review of, of my decisions if there wasn't the opportunity to go to the tribunal. So we might exchange one, one load of lawyers for another load of lawyers. I don't, I don't think it's a get out of jail free card. 
but um, to the extent that it's not an appeal very often on a point of law, but is can we run the case again? Um, I, I suppose uh, that there, there is a bit of a problem there. Thank you. Just as a supplementary, do you know what the experience in Scotland is? I mean, in, in terms where, where there's, there is there's no intermediate appeal to an equivalent of the first tier tribunal. I mean, is that regarded, is the Scottish experience regarded as satisfactory by your colleagues, more satisfactory than, or less satisfactory than the situation in England and Wales? Well, um, uh, we see the Scottish system working well, um, but at the point I've just uh, made to Lord Carlyle, um, if we avoided a lot of tribunal cases but landed up with a lot of judicial review cases instead, we would be no better off. Nobody would be any, any better off. Um, but uh, where there isn't really a legal point to be argued, um, it's simply the question of setting someone else's judgment against, against the commissioners. But, but, but you would be better off, wouldn't you, in this sense, in that um, your decisions could only be appealed on a point of law and there wouldn't be a complete rehearing. Um, yes, so even if it was judicial review, it's still a point of law. Um, no, I, I, take, I take your point. But I, I, I think that the, the, the most um, controversial questions, uh, it's always going to be very difficult to accept that, that the game is over. Um, the very fact that people have come to the commissioner and made a section 50 question uh, it very often just demonstrates that what people won't take no for an answer. Um, so if they weren't able to go to um, the first tier tribunal, um, then we might very well be landed with more judicial reviews. But isn't the, the set of principles by which judicial review is managed proportionality and reasonableness in a couple of words, ideally um, suited to the sort of review that should take place given that you carry out on the evidence that we've seen a uh, rigorous factual assessment of each case. I mean, what is the point of having two factual assessments of each, ca of each case? Is there one? Um, well, I think it would be very arrogant of of, of me to say that, that, that I've got um, magic powers and will always get everything, will always get everything right. Um, but I suppose if there is the safety valve of, of judicial review, that might deal with situations where something had gone manifestly wrong. But, but certainly the system at the moment is very expensive for all concerned. It's very expensive for, yeah, time consuming. Um, I have to put considerable resources into making sure that we're properly represented before the tribunal, we make the best case we can and so on in order to, to def defend our decision. So I suppose if one was looking for savings within the system, then, then having, uh, adopting the Scottish system would, uh, would be an improvement. Perhaps we could move on to um, collective cabinet responsibility. Uh, you say in your evidence uh, that uh, the, the public interest in that must be given due weight. Um, uh, you also say that where cabinet material has been ordered for release, it's because it was old, anodyne, or does not reveal the nature of the discussions. So I uh, would like you to explore for us a bit more how, how you explain the weight you place on letting people have that material if it is of little value versus the principle of the weight to be given to protecting collective responsibility. Yes, well, the, um, the, the, the locus classicus is the decision which was taken my, by my predecessor over the uh, cabinet minutes of the decision to, uh, to go to war uh, in, in Iraq. This was a decision taken b before my time, but I understand uh, why, that, why that decision was was, was taken, and it was a decision that was uh, supported when it went to um, the tribunal, the first tier tribunal, but uh, ultimately was, uh, was vetoed. And I don't, don't uh, challenge the, the right of the, the Secretary of State, having consulted 
uh, cabinet colleagues to take advantage of that section of the act to say that the, 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 the executive override should, uh, should win. But clearly, my predecessor, Richard Thomas, felt that this was uh, uh, a, a, an exception um, in view of the gravity of the, 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 uh, the, the decision that was taken. I mean, presumably we will know more ab about all this when, when, when Chilcot finally uh, reports. But um, that, that, that is very, very rare. Uh, I haven't had to face similar decision. And many, many other decisions, not of, of that uh, um, seriousness, of course, have gone, gone the other way. Not, not about cabinet minutes, but about very important, difficult government decisions. So I don't think one should uh, assume that because the commissioner took a particular view uh, in relation to the Iraq uh, uh, cabinet minutes, that's the way that uh, these things always go, because they don't. No, quite. Um, and you've answered my next question. But what I was really trying to get you to address was the weight to be placed on uh, the importance of collective cabinet responsibility and uh, why you would um, think about releasing documents that were old or anodyne. Because that weighs against collective responsibility, whatever your view of the nature of the documents you're, you know, we're not talking about a controversial case like the Iraq case, but the normal process. Yes. Well, um, these, are, these, are always, these are always difficult cases, and Parliament has not provided uh, for an absolute exemption, but a qualified exemption. The qualified exemption means that the circumstances of the individual case will, will have to be looked, and a public interest test applied. It's very difficult to come before a commission and, 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 and have some sort of general answer that deals with all the cases because the whole point is that every case is, is different. Um, follow up on, on, on that question. Uh, I notice, and I've read a lot of the, um, of your judgments and I have let, or I've read a, a lot of the first tier tribunal uh, decisions as well. And it seems to me there is a, a, a ready acceptance about collective cabinet responsibility and the fact that uh, cabinet ministers have to go out and, uh, and defend policies that cabinet mm. has concluded means that it would be very difficult if their individual views that they had expressed at the time were to be made public at the time that these interests are, are very live. And, and yet you don't give the same weight to the discussions between senior officials and their, their ministers, where very often they're in a very similar position where the officials have to go and appear before select committees. They've got to explain government policy. And it would really, you know, it, is it really possible to have a system whereby in that situation that they could be cross-examined about uh, the advice that they had given, which might have differed from, from the decision that the cabinet minister subsequently took? I I think the I think Parliament's passed legislation that, that makes it very clear that the, 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 the documents will be published unless there is a very good reason why they shouldn't be, and the 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 doctrine of collective cabinet responsibility is 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 one of the factors that we have to take into account. But I think we we, we have to live in the real world, and we we're aware of. Uh, leaks that take place, briefings, ministerial memoirs, so far as civil servants are concerned, I do see that they're in a difficult, a difficult position. But again, we are, we're all, uh, we, we, I, think, I think we understand that, uh, that uh, civil servants uh, have to go and bat for, 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 the, for the policy that's, that's been agreed. I don't think anyone would think that because a civil servant is representing their minister, they, they, they're necessarily passionately in favor of the, the policy that's been adopted. They're professional civil servants. They're, they're arguing a case. What, I'm, what I would be concerned about was a, an absolute exemption applying in these, these areas, because I think that would get us back to the sort of pre-Franks uh, committee position where You'll remember the definition which uh, the Sir Martin Furnival Jones gave: "What is an official secret? Anything that's in an official file." Which was very easy in those days. And I don't think anyone, I'm sure, the commission. No, no, I'm not. Wants to no, get I'm not remotely. No, I'm not remote. No, I'm not at all suggesting uh, about an absolute exemption. I'm. I was just contrasting the weight that you give to 
collective responsibility by ministers mm. as opposed to the weight that you give to the sort of quasi-collective responsibility of officials who have to appear on behalf of uh, ministers but who may also have been involved in the decision-making process. Yes, well, I think um, one gets to give, needs to give due respect to uh, the safe space for the frank discussion of policy options and advice to be given and so on, but it's very difficult to see how you could uh, operate other than with um, an absolute exemption unless you make 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 a judgment and that's what we try and do um, a couple of questions on risk registers um, does the ICO use risk registers and do you publish them absolutely um, yes I can uh, thank you um, you say that access to risk registers can provide the public with additional information about the progress of significant projects Hmm. Could you explain that? Because one doesn't normally associate risk registers with project management. Uh, what do you have in mind? Um, the, the two cases I can think of where we uh, ordered publication uh, were concerned with um, uh, the National Health Service and the, the health service reforms in, in the last parliament. And that was uh, resisted very strongly. And also the risk register around the uh, the HS2 project um, and I just think we all ought to be grown up enough to, to recognize that a risk register is what it what it says on the tin uh, I would be very suspicious of management that didn't maintain risk registers which contemplated all sorts of unfortunate outcomes if they weren't properly mitigated a risk register is a is a good sign um, and uh, provided the management have put in place what they would do if things went wrong, a risk register should be a, a reassurance. But it's something about the word risk has people running off saying, oh, we don't want to admit to that. Thank you very much. But it's not hard and fast. And again, I can point to a couple of applications for access to risk registers where we took a different view. One of them was the Department of the Environment and and uh, climate change when a risk register around um, carbon capture and storage was sought and, 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 and we said no. And another one was with the Department of Work and Pensions around uh, uh, the application of the universal credit. So again, it, it, it depends. But I don't think that um, risk registers should always be uh, should, 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 should be guaranteed to be private because I think sometimes it will contain information that the public needs to know about. And do you think there's a distinction between risk registers and other forms of risk assessment, um, such as paragraphs in a submission outlining risks? I mean, to what, to what extent uh, can uh, a government or a department or an organisation um, anticipate a distinction between uh, the kind of assessment of risk that really wants to shake it down before you get to the mitigating stage and that mm. there would be a sensible distinction between the two. Well, that might well be covered by uh, the exemptions dealing with uh, uh, advice to ministers or ministerial communications or um, safe space for frank advice and, and so on. So I don't, I don't see... I don't see a red flag around a risk register saying always this is going to be you know, not, not in front of the children. In fact, it's a, it is the not in front of the children attitude that I think it was many years ago uh, so corrosive. And the achievement of the Freedom of Information Act is to, is to put that one to, to bed. And I, I, wouldn't, I don't think any of us would want to get back to that, that situation where, you, where you, you were sort of infantilizing the electorate they weren't allowed to realize that there were big and difficult choices that had to be made and difficult risks that had to be managed. Mm. Thank you. Hand over to my colleague. Um, thank you. Can, I, can I turn to some questions now about the veto? Yeah. Um, and I'm, I have regard particularly to paragraphs 42 and 43 of your written evidence. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you an open question first, uh, Commissioner. Um, if you were asked to advise Parliament on the veto, on the assumption that it was going to remain in place in some form or another, what advice would you give, if any, as to changes in the way the veto operates? 
Um, the veto uh, has operated with um, a policy agreed by the Cabinet, um, which has a lot of talk about exceptional cases. Um, the few vetoes that have come my way over the past six and a half years, I've racked my brains to find out what were the exceptional circumstances. I could see there were circumstances in which an exception was being made, but that's, that's different. Um, what has happened when a veto, when a veto has been um, deployed, then the commissioner has made a report to the Justice Select Committee, um, but uh, only in the case of the HS2 decision have I ever sought to challenge a veto. Um, the reason I did in that case was because, as I had tried to point out to the Secretary of State and to the Lord Chancellor at the time, you couldn't veto that decision because it was under the Environment Information Regulations and look, there isn't a veto. And it was only after no one had listened to me that I landed up having been the most unfortunate <coughs> position of of taking the government for judicial review because it seemed to me they were, they were acting unlawfully. Uh, but by and large, uh, we've, we've, we've reported to Parliament and we've just got on with it. It's very clear to me that um, the, the point the, in the legislative debate where the Commissioner was given an order-making power as opposed to a recommendation was in exchange for the executive override being by being explicit. So the change I would want to see in practice, never mind the legislation, would be, look, if this really is the crown jewels, then get on and veto it um, at an early stage. Don't go through tribunal one, tribunal two, the courts, and then deploy a veto. And the problem that we've got is with the judges because they don't appreciate um, judicial bodies being uh, met with an executive override. If you veto me, that doesn't arise. And I've suggested in my remarks earlier that you could have a sort of positive affirmation. Um, uh, you know, Gad, sir, the information commissioner is right, which would be indicating that um, this was a, a matter on which the government would, uh, would seek to apply the veto. I don't think uh, that might involve um, a legislative change, I, I, I suppose. So I think we've now, we've all grown up a bit, and it's not for the commissioner to start screaming from the rooftops when the government uses the executive override, which is clearly there in the legislation. The difficulty we've got is simply over this question of executive versus uh, judiciary, and that wouldn't arise if the government did their stuff earlier on. Does it follow from what you're saying that your recommendation would be that the veto should only be available at the commissioner stage and not at a later stage? Um, only being the important part well, of the question. I, I, I suppose the courts have put us in that position because the, the Supreme Court has, has indicated that, uh, that um, doing it at a later stage is, is unlawful. And as I've said, in relation to the Environment Information Regulations, it isn't there at all. But possibly, uh, whether, whether it involves a change in the law, I think it's a question for ministers to, to decide when they want to play that, whether they want to play that card. If they want to play that card, they ought to do it at the point where they're dealing with an executive body rather than a judicial body. But it would be a big decision, um, and it's really got to be in cases that really are matters of high seriousness, mm. not simply we don't like this sort of thing and we wish it wasn't happening, which very often seems to, it seems to be the case. But of course, I, I, I can't know what the, the reasons behind a veto might be. Mm. The veto has been exercised, what, seven times in the last 10 years? Something like that, yes. yes. And yes. as you pointed out, the HS2 case, the issue was a point of law. Yes. Not a point of practice. Absolutely a point of law. Um, I, when I report, my, my predecessor established this, uh, this principle that the, the, um, the commissioner would make a special report to the Justice Committee, as it what then, then was. Um, uh, and that's what we've done. We've never, we've never sought to, to challenge the government's right and minister's right to impose a veto, except in the HS2 case, and as you say, that was on a point of law.
Um, can we use the Prince of Wales letters case just as a brief example? In that case, you, as you said earlier, upheld the decision of the public authorities, which of course made it impossible, at that time at least, for them to use the veto early. If the veto was limited to the ICO stage, then that would make it usable even where the ICO agreed with the public authority. Do you think that the practice of exercising the veto, availability of exercise of the veto at that stage, never mind what the court, mm. Supreme Court said, on the merits is the appropriate stage for its exercise if it's going to be exercised at all? Uh, yes, I do, because I think that uh, it would focus the politician's mind. It would be a very big step to say, sorry, this is going no further. You'd have to be, you'd have to be able to make the case that there was a really important uh, matter at stake. It, it, couldn't, it couldn't be, we don't like this sort of thing, so tell you what, we're going to stop it. Um, very often, the arguments that, that, that appear um, before, the, before, the, well, before the commissioner, but also before the tribunal, um, are, are not terribly persuasive. Um, but if, if ministers were going to have to play their card very early, they'd have to be pretty sure that they could then deal with the political flack. You wouldn't be getting flack from the commissioner because that's not my job. But there might be quite a lot of fallout in Parliament, I suppose. Thank you. Um, I was going to move on from um, the veto um, to appeals. You've already dealt very helpfully with the difference between the system in England and Wales and the system in Scotland. Is there anything else you would like to add in comparison between those two systems? Because the implication of your earlier evidence yeah. might be that the Scottish system is tidier, quicker, and more effective, and at least as fair. Would you accept those propositions? Uh, the, um, the Scottish system, of course, is on a much smaller scale, um, but they are able to do some, some things that I would dearly like to see, there's much better information about exactly what's going on in freedom of information in Scotland because every public authority reports into the Scottish Information Commissioner with their performance statistics and they're upheld and they're not upheld. I don't have that picture uh, for the rest of the UK. The only figures that I've got um, are the figures from central government which are collected, but we've got so many more public authorities. It would be be good to have um, to have that sort of uh, that sort of uh, uh, information to to hand. Um, I think the Scottish the Scottish system certainly works very well, and once it's once it gets going and everyone knows what the rules are, um, uh, that, that 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 works very satisfactorily. I think. On a separate point, I wanted to ask you about the internal review stage. Um, yes. Is it your view that the internal review stage really adds value, uh, or should um, authorities really be getting it right the first time without the need for an, intern uh, an internal review? Well, a lot of the decisions um, first time round will be taken at a fairly junior level in the organisation, and I think it, the internal review process gives organisations the opportunity for a, for a, second, for a second look. Um, but it does appear in certain circumstances that that can go on to the crack of doom because there is no uh, 20 working day limit yeah. on it. And uh, one does sometimes see situations where authorities get extension after extension after extension or, or, or explain that they can't attend to the matter because, because, because. Um, I would have thought that eight weeks to give a definitive answer at public authority level would be adequate. So you've got 20 working days for the initial decision I would then say that it would be reasonable to say a further 20 days for um, an, an internal review, um, and that would give the authority eight, eight weeks to get, it, to get it right. As a general observation, is it your experience that internal reviews are carried out at a sufficiently senior level in the authority for it to be regarded as a genuine review? Oh, uh, Yes, and indeed my organisation is a public authority under mm. the Act, and that, that's when I get uh, called in on uh, freedom of information requests that, that concern the, the Information Commissioner. Of course, also at that stage, you may be having to take decisions as the qualified person under Section 36, 
uh, which means that the matters are are are, are, es are escalated. Um, so no, I think that it, in, internal review, so long as the system isn't uh, abused and just uses a reason for, for for not taking a decision, you usually get better decisions as a result of a more senior figure being involved in the case. Can I, me, interrupting. Can I just ask you about the qualified person provision? Some of the evidence, in section, which is in section 36, some of the evidence we've received suggests that that requirement for there to be a qualified person to make the decision um, is unnecessary. And interestingly, it's not required when it comes to statistical information. I wondered whether you had a view about that. Well, I think, it's, um, I, I think it, it does involve the escalation of the issue, so that the chief executive um, is, is aware of uh, a difficult matter being, being considered and has to um, apply his or her judgment to the matter. And it's not simply a question of uh, saying, oh, it's come to me, I just sign, sign off and here we go. You've really got to in engage your brain and work out whether you are um, persuaded by the arguments that you're being invited to consider. I think it's a good system. In my, my experience so, uh, of, of Whitehall was, for example, with uh, parliamentary questions, written questions, that yeah. there was an escalation procedure that was built into this process from the beginning, because obviously it was going out in the name of the, uh, of the minister. Uh, and I do worry that uh, two things. One is that um, by having this two-stage process, you actually encourage people to say no at the first uh, step on the belief that a lot of people will go away and only if they try hard will it actually go to the internal uh, review. Um, and then, you know, at a later stage it may be escalated up, as you say, with the qualified person, but why can't this be a seamless process whereby, um, you know, things that are sensitive naturally go through the, the process from the word go? I think we have a lot of sympathy with you about the issue of how long many of these cases take, I mean, which is why mm. we're pursuing this, uh, uh, this line of questioning. I mean, there are cases that are going on for years, mm. uh, which seems to be a very strange uh, uh, outcome for <laughs> the notion of freedom of information. Yes, well, there, there are fewer cases that go on for years than there were six and a half years ago uh, because, we, yeah. uh, because, because we got rid of the backlog public authorities know that we're onto the case much, much earlier. And uh, a, a, as a result, the whole thing has, has speeded up and is, and is much uh, improved. But it'd be nice to think that if decisions were taken at a junior level of the organization, they'd be inclined to say yes to, pub uh, to publication, which is what the legislation is supposed to be about. Um, if more information was, was, was published proactively, um, uh, it, it, it would be better. And many of the stories we see in the papers about freedom of information are only stories because somebody said no. Usually, if you hit people with the boring facts, there is no story. But the great, the great struggle that uh, the Daily Bugle had to get hold of this information from the reluctant bureaucrats who wouldn't publish it is usually the only story there is. Um, public authorities, as you know, uh, sometimes complain about the burdens that they experience as a result of FOI. Um, do you think that there is a more effective mechanism that can be deployed to reduce their burdens or perceived burdens other than fees? Uh, well, fees would impose their own burden because the, there's, a, there's a cost in levying a fee for a start. I, 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 I think any, any fee that you contemplated would be unlikely to meet the costs of, of, uh, of actually dealing with freedom of information requests and there would be a certain amount of cost in actually uh, issuing the uh, the invoice, I wish public authorities would actually use the, the the provisions of the Act to turn away some of the most burdensome stuff. We've got um, clear um, uh, exemption in Section 14 of the Act for the manifestly vexatious requests. But public authorities who are complaining about how terrible life is and how burdensome it is because of all these sad, mad, and bad people who are bombarding them with questions are most reluctant to use the Section 14 power, despite the fact that our guidance is, is very clear, guidance supported in the decision of the first tier tribunal only this week, who are very uh, firm in their dismissal of a, of a 
completely unreasonable uh, and obsessive uh, requester. And public authorities just ought to be a bit braver about saying no. So you're saying that public authorities really don't quite understand fully the power they have to say no in cases where there are vexatious or unduly burdensome requests? I think sometimes they just don't want the row, because there is a row. If you tell somebody they're vexatious, they, they, they don't take it well, um, but <laughs> to say the least. Um, but, but if you constantly humor people by saying, well, actually, information not held, rather than, this is silly, go away, um, you, you make a rod for your, for your own back. Can I, Mr. Graham, uh, come on to the issue of resources, because yeah. you um, said it earlier on in your evidence that your budget had been reduced each year that yeah. you've been in post. Uh, I, this is not a question about fees, by yeah. the way. Um, but there are two parts to this. One, first of all, I'm, I'm not aware that we've had evidence from you, and apologies if I missed it, about yeah. the, um, your resources, and, it, and if, yeah. if, if either correct me or if, if we could have that, that would be, I think, really helpful. Okay. Um, and if you've got any evidence about what other comparable jurisdictions have in terms of resources, I think that would be very helpful. Um, the, 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 the second um, is to ask whether you, you, you've made a lot about the fact that in Scotland they are better at receiving the experience of handling FOI and giving guidance on it. I, mean, I know it's a smaller jurisdiction. Um, but is also part of your problem that you don't have the resources to be able to act as a, a better coordinator and clearinghouse uh, yeah. and offer of guidance. Yeah. Can I follow that up with, uh, I, did I interpret correctly that you were making a suggestion that in Scotland there was a better provision of the non-central government public authorities in terms of statistics to the Information Commissioner in Scotland yeah. than we have in the UK? I don't yeah, know whether it's under legislation, but every public authority in Scotland. But makes would you like to have that uh, situation? Yes, here? I, I, I would, and I think it would. I think it would Im improve matters greatly. Uh, the, on the resources point, I'll, I'll certainly provide uh, evidence to to the commission um, and try and get some international comparative uh, com comparisons as well. Uh, the, the frustrating thing is that I I do have the resources. I'm just not allowed to spend them on freedom of information. Uh, I, 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 have, I have the resources on the data protection side, but I can't spend that on freedom of information would, without getting it, would, in trouble with the Control and Auditor General. But if, and if, I was going to ask you that, because, of course, for data protection, you've got the fees that yeah. um, well, individual applicants pay, but, what, but, yeah. but the, the data controllers pay to you. Yeah. It, you would like to, uh, the, the opportunity to avire between data protection and FOI, since they are two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Is that right? And to, and to some extent, we can for back office costs and so right. on. But where I've got something that is specifically about yeah. freedom of information, even though uh, information rights are increasingly a, yeah. a, a seamless web, and I'll be dealing with public authorities who are, who are uh, one minute uh, m making decision about open data, sure. and the next minute deciding sure. about transparency on the freedom of information side. And because I can't via between those two, I'm sometimes having to give money to the contingency, uh, not contingency fund, the consolidated fund mm. at the end of the year because I couldn't spend it. Uh, but, and I've got work that I would dearly love to sure. do yeah. on the freedom of information side. For example, uh, when we're, 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 we've decided to to just go ahead and do this this year, but for years we have had a very big and very successful data protection practitioners conference. I haven't been able to afford to do a, a freedom of information practitioners conference. Very often they're the same, same people. Yeah, sure. But, you know, well, please don't mention okay. freedom of information. Could, could we have a supplementary note about that as yeah. well, please? Okay. 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 Just Thanks. one final question on a fairly practical matter, redactions. Whenever a document comes out of the public services with any redactions in it, there's an immediate suspicion that something terrible is being hidden. On the other hand, um, there is uh, clearly merit in, and indeed a duty sometimes, to remove personal data by redaction. Yeah. Do you have any advice to give to this commission as to whether we should be making some suggestions about the way redactions are dealt with? Um, I, th I think um, if, uh, if redaction is the price of the publication of 90% of the document, then I'm all in favor of it. And I think it's an important principle, and 
since I wear a data protection hat as well as a freedom of information hat, that there are circumstances in which the personal information of individuals should be, should be protected, um, and it's specific in the Freedom of Information Act, um, and that's why the redactions are made. But you're, you're right, if you see a document and it's full of, of, of black, mm. you, you assume that, that there is something to hide, and it may not be something as, uh, as innocent as the individual uh, as the identity of particular civil servants who were at a meeting or giving up piece of piece of advice. I don't think there's anything I can really suggest that will help the Commission, except, except for one thing, if I may, if we're, if we're drawing to the end. I do hope that the Commission's also going to be able to look at some of those outstanding recommendations from the Justice Select Committee, because there's work to be done, particularly involving those uh, contractors who are taking on responsibility for, the, for public services but are not covered by freedom of information. Uh, I, can I say that uh, although it actually is, is not part of our, our terms of reference, we have been looking at this and uh, we will um, have something to say about it. Uh, I have one final question. What I've noticed is there's a very large difference between public bodies and the extent to which they automatically publish the questions and answers for freedom of information uh, requests. And okay. it rather puzzles me why a lot of people, are, uh, public authorities, are prepared to hand over lots of information without making it more publicly available. Uh, do you have a view about this? Well, they're supposed to, um, they're supposed to maintain a, 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 a log. A, a log. Uh, and again, if I had the resources to do it, I would be chasing up more of these logs to find out what, 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 what's going on. Many of the requests that I have to deal with as a public authority come to me on a whatdotheyknow.com. Mm -hmm. uh, and the publication there involves both the, the question and the answer. And, and it's, it's there for all to see. But, um, it's not always the case. If you've, if you've actually, if you've concluded that under the Freedom of Information Act you ought to make something available, it makes common sense to make it generally available because then that gives you a reason for not having to publish it a second time. You just yes. refer people to the log. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's been very helpful and um, uh, that's been a very valuable uh, discussion. And again, we, we're very grateful for the evidence that you have provided and, uh, and, and, and uh, we look forward to hearing the the suggestions that, uh, that, uh, that Jack has made. Thank you for the opportunity to no, address thank the you Commission, very much. And, I, and I will uh, uh, get the additional information on yes. resources for you. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, Lord McNally. Uh, as you will see from our, our agenda, we're, we're, we're having a, a quite a busy afternoon trying to push as many people through as, as we can, but we're very interested to hear evidence. Uh, I said earlier, um, I don't think you were here, that uh, we've had a lot of evidence, uh, and we've had some very good evidence, and uh, we would like to follow up some of those, those issues, and we, uh, we're very grateful for you uh, coming uh, this afternoon. Uh, I think, Jack, you're going to start the question. Yeah. Well, shall I say, first of all, is there anything you want to say by way of an opening statement? No, from uh, the way you were questioning, if, if there's something that you don't ask me about, I'll tell you about it at the end. <laughs> I think that's probably the best. Since uh, thank you very much, Lord McNally. Um, towards the end of the written evidence, for which thank you, uh, you gave to us, uh, the penultimate paragraph, you, you, you talked about... Uh, your personal experience, um, and then one of, to say that since becoming the chairman of an arm's length body, the Youth Justice Board, mm -hmm. I've encouraged open governance whilst on occasion invoking, invoking uh, the Freedom of Information Act uh, to protect information in the public interest mm -hmm. without obviously giving away what you've sought to protect. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I wondered if it, in, in, in generic terms you could describe the information that you've sought to protect by way yes, of the I mean, it's very, very simple. Um, the Guardian were wanting to see um, the um, reports of our monitors in a secure children's home, the, uh, uh, um, a secure training college, um, which had, was in the public eye. And I was happy to release the monitor's report but in a way that made it impossible to identify the children 
um, in, in our care. And I think that was, per and to be fair to the Guardian, the Guardian they accepted that that was a, a perfectly right. uh, sensible so, re redaction. But that, that presumably was a holding back information under data protection mm. redactions rather than under section 35 and 36 of the I, act I, I wouldn't claim to be oh, a, right, okay. I, okay. I just so, I just thought it was common sense no. well, I mean, uh, yeah. to 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 yeah. apply it in yeah. that way yeah. so that, that this reference does not refer to any um, I mean some some let me say there were some people giving me advice saying that we should simply say no uh, and that I thought would, uh, which goes to a lot of what, what your discussion, that would only encourage the Guardian to think that we had something to hide, which we didn't. Okay. Um, but the way we could present that uh, had to uh, comply with our, our duties right. to protect the children in our care. So, so that particular reference was not a reference to requests for uh, advice, internal advice, which you're receiving no. from, the, no. from, from the officials? Okay. No. Let me just, you would have heard uh, Mr. Graham talk about resources, and I see you were, during the period you were, you were the Minister for Freedom of Information Act, responsible for their resources, so I accept mm. that, that uh, they were set, obviously, by the Cabinet as a whole. What is your view about the level of resources available to the Commissioner, and do you share his opinion uh, that uh, this restriction on the Commissioner using his inf income stream from uh, data protection uh, data holders uh, should be uh, ended. I, I think it should be investigated. Um, I'm worried, and I was worried when I was part of a government that was cutting budgets. It, it, it's uh, there's two ways of, of getting uh, rid of, of uh, an inconvenient. Uh, organization what, what one is to abolish it and the, the other is to uh, kill it by salami slicing and um, so I do, I do think uh, that if we continue to believe in freedom of information um, as I hope we will um, that we make sure that the information commissioner uh, retains the resources to do the job possible properly. If I may say so as well, I, I, just to put on the record, I, th I think w we have been very, very well served uh, by uh, Chris Graham. He's shown a, a robust integrity in the way that he's done it, that, so that at various times he's successfully annoyed ministers and campaign groups, uh, which is usually a good test of, of, of somebody in his, his position. On the question of data protection, as he, right, as he rightly worried, we're all worried uh, that we will get hauled up before the Public Accounts Committee or some such body for misuse of public yeah. funds. But it does seem to me, um, I think it was you, uh, Mr. Straw, who said it's the same side of the same yeah, coin, yeah, um, that if, if, if it were legal, um, I think it could it could well be a, a way forward in terms of making sure that resources were maintained. Um, in, in the evidence you've put forward and things you've said outside uh, your, your... I, mean, the, I must say, the evidence might have just as much case have been a letter to The Guardian, but I thought having gone to the trouble of writing it, I'd send it to you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I mean, I, 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 so it, you, I, I don't expect you to change your mind between submitting no, evidence no, here no, and no. writing to the Guardian. It's, it's, <laughs> it's the, um, but but I, I, I'm not expecting it to, to go into academic analysis no, in I, this I, respect. I, well, it, it, it was just a... Maybe you'd like to wait, wait for the question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was just to say you've been robust uh, in your defence of, uh, of, of, of the Act um, and in um, your, if you like, dismissal of the view that there mm. is a, a, a clear chilling effect from the, from the Act. Um, on the other hand, I think you, you do accept that the, the concept of a, of, a, of a safe space. Yeah, absolutely. Picking up what Lord Burns uh, was asking uh, Mr. Graham, do you accept that that safe space must as much apply between a minister and his or her officials, if, if you like, vertically in an organization as it 
should horizontally between a minister and his fellow ministers? Yes, I do. Uh, I mean, d just when I was listening to that, um, I saw the permanent undersecretary of the Ministry of Justice and uh, her, it was then um, Ursula Brennan and her senior officials uh, defending the cuts to legal aid um, that had been made by the government in front of the Public Accounts Committee. And I thought that the hostility and the questioning of civil servants uh, at that w was quite improper yep. um, uh, and unfair. Um, they were not there. To, the the per people who should have been there to answer the questions in the way that they were put uh, should have been the politicians. And therefore, I think the, the, there should be a, a protection uh, on that. Um, uh, in between ministers, it, it is... Um, there has been a change. I mean, I'm, I'm just about old enough to remember the publication of the Crossman Diaries and the absolute outrage at that stage, uh, at the way that Dick Crossman uh, revealed uh, his battles with the dame and, and all this kind of things. Uh, but uh, as, as Chris Graham said, now we have memoirs and we have uh, leaks and, and we... Uh, we have a, a much earlier um, uh, disclosure. I mean, I, I, I was mildly embarrassed when a memo I had sent to Jim Callaghan recommending that he shouldn't see John Prescott um, about um, the Icelandic fishing dispute um, because I said, oh, he's just showboating. Um, was finally published when John Prescott was Deputy Prime Minister. <laughs> but the, the, that's one of the risks. Lord McNally, um, you served with distinction as a minister and in a coalition government at that, and if I may say so, you're a renowned canny political operator. In the tension of, for example, a coalition government, doesn't FOI create a chilling effect to the extent that ministers may well choose to commit things that normally would be committed to writing only to an oral space, to an exchange of views privately? Um, I'm not, I mean, do ministers talk privately about each other? Yes, but I don't think this needs a coalition government to get that phenomenon. You mean any action. government? No. Um, I, I, and quite honestly, within the coalition, the, the battle lines on policy and that were, were not drawn on party lines in, in many cases. And I, I, I mean, just to go to the, this chilling effect, I, mean, I can honestly say, uh, and I've heard all the mandarins who've spoken in our Lord's debates on this, I, I, I did not witness it myself. In fact, and I, when I gave my views to the Institute of Government about my experience, one of the things that impressed me going back into Whitehall after a long gap since, since I was there in the mid-70s was, was what I described as the democracy uh, of Whitehall, that you would, as a minister, be surrounded by officials and uh, relatively young and junior officials would robustly give advice in, uh, to ministers uh, at, a at a stage. And uh, I think I've mentioned before, there was a difference between uh, Francis Maud and myself. Francis was a strong supporter of open data, but was less enthusiastic uh, about FOI. And we had a meeting at the Cabinet Office, uh, which was quite robust, and where the, there was uh, a lady civil servant there who kept on chipping in with, with her uh, hostile views to FOI. And, and her final coup de grace was, of course, and there is the chilling effect. And I said, well, I've not noticed much chilling in the last 20 minutes from you. Because, and so I, I really, I've, I've, I've heard the mandarins, uh, and they've spoken about it. I have not myself witnessed it. But could I, uh, and uh, I understand that, and I notice what you say in your, your evidence about there still being a great culture of secrecy. But if we take the example that you gave of your officials appearing before the PAC, uh, having to answer questions about cuts in, in legal uh, aid, um, in a world where, since their advice to you, which may have been that there should not have been cuts on this scale, had been published before their appearance, I mean, it would make that appearance doubly 
yeah. difficult, yeah. and you wouldn't want to see that. I think it makes it for difficulties. And, uh, but but uh, what I would say... I mean, that must affect. The way the case, act, it must the affect. The way the it. act is, is working gives, gives protections. Yeah. I, uh, I, I accept that, although the point I was making the Information Commissioner, it's very noticeable to me that in the decisions there is much more emphasis given to the issue about confidentiality and collective responsibility between ministers than mm. there is in terms of ministers and their relationship with officials. Mm. I but, mean, that, but, but yeah, I agree. But, I, mean, but I, I, d I don't want to, to run off with the idea that, that somehow, I, I think that the, the example I gave was an abuse, not a, a way the system should run. If the system runs yeah, well. pro properly, properly, it, it should um, uh, not, not expose well, I, had, I had the pleasure of appearing before the Public Accounts Committee many times in my, in my life, and uh, I often thought to myself that it would be better if the minister was present <laughs> rather than me. But, um, but could, could, I, sorry, could I just uh, pursue the point that Lord Burns has, has raised? Because if, if in, uh, I mean, I personally think that the, the safe space is actually need, needed even more to protect the, it's, it's chilling uh, effect is, I think a misnomer, it's about maintaining the bond of tr trust between officials at any level and ministers without mm. which governance would break down. And so you accept that in, in this case, if Ursula Brennan's advice or that of officials further down, which had been probably uh, to, to fight the cuts and to say what a disaster these would, would have, had then been made available, it would have made, made the, her life impossible, but it would also have made ministers' life impossible too. But, but it's they, re rarely given in those ways, as you, you, know, you, you well know. And it, I mean, it goes back again. Uh, once you get used to uh, freedom of information, uh, some of these things cause a, a maturity in discourse. I, I argued very strongly uh, when I was trying to take a bill through Parliament to, to release the risk register, uh, and it was fiercely uh, resisted, um, uh, both by officials and by um, my elders and betters in the Commons, who th said, oh, if the Commons get, you get hold of a risk register, they'll tear us to pieces. Um, but the, but, but I, I argued unsuccessfully that risk, as, as, as Chris Graham described it, what it says in the tin, it describes risk. It, it's not a forecast of what's going to happen. It's a prudent look at what might happen. Um, but but um, it, I, I'm worried that you're going, if you pin your uh, your moves on, on the idea that you're going to save these poor benighted civil servants because I've not seen much evidence during the working of the Act of civil servants being exposed in this way. No, I, I think the way that it's, um, I, I would agree with you, the way that it's worked by and large, if one goes down the, the various cases, the amount of material that has been released that, that has caused great problems is, is, is not large. Mm. Uh, and the, I think the, what, however, is the case is made, and this is my only reason for pressing this, the case is made that the way that the Act is drafted and the way that many of these cases develop, that it generates more uncertainty amongst officials than, than is necessarily the case, and that there should be greater clarity with it. Mm, well, I, I, you know, as the I outcomes say, are, it's not so much the outcomes, it's the sort of these extended and rather long processes that sometimes have to be gone through. Over. I think the length of the process is, but one of the things is that if you had from the very top a determination to free up information, um, the costs and time w would go. Partly, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned the culture of secrecy. The problem is both in local government and uh, uh, in uh, national government, it's great if the chairman's mic falls, he can't shut me up. <laughs> no, but, but if, if, you, if you've got genuine freedom of information, uh, why, one of the reasons why I so supported Francis Maud's mm. open data, the, the more you've got information out there um, of course. as part of the system, 
the rest, is, I mean, t two examples. That but where should the leadership come from? Uh, well, Lord I think both, I mean, that's the question both from that ministers, I both from ministers and from senior civil servants. Let me give you two recent examples of freedom of information. Um, the uh, one effect in my old department, it was recently re revealed how many prisoners were released by mistake by norms each week. I think the figure is four. Sometimes they're released three days early or, or, or something. But why the hell was that kept back? Actually, it, it, it's a good piece of information to keep norms on its toes. And yet it took a freedom of information case to get it out. Last night in the Evening Standard, it's revealed that Westminster City Council have spent £90,000 on a new Rolls Royce for their Lord Mayor. Might be embarrassing for Westminster City Council, but why shouldn't the good burghers of Westminster know how much Westminster City Council is spending on their Rolls Royce? And, and that's one of the things when you... Well, when, when you talk about cost and benefit, it, it's very difficult to get the full cost benefit, but I suspect both at national level and at local government level, uh, there's many a pound being saved by people saying, oh, well, if we do this, it will be FOI'd and will we have hell to play? No, great. Just always to remember that data, uh, open data, is what government wants to tell you. Freedom of information is what we want to know. No, well, thank you very much. Thank and you very we much. Will, uh, I, I we have just, that ringing in our ears. I just put on record, I was just thinking, of the, it's 50 years since I first heard the radical president of Leeds University addressing an NUS conference. That's, that's how long I've known. And I won't go along the rest of this distinguished body uh, about how long we've known each other. But, uh. <laughs> no, well, it's been very helpful. Thanks very much.